Traditionally, Chiloé has been, was, was poor, and it was so poor they couldn't afford iron or steel, so they did everything with wood. So this, this church, is, like all the churches on Chiloé, is entirely built with wood, including the nails. There, there are wooden trunnels that were used to build this church that is still standing today. Thank you. It's open? Okay. This working? Yep. This sounds it. <laughs> so after, when spring came, I got a new, new crew and left Castro and we headed south. It's a fishing village called Malinka and it's pretty typical of the, the villages around in the, in the north end of Patagonia. You notice the dogs. Dogs roam the street in Chile. There's no such thing as dog catchers and people don't use leashes. And they chase after cars and they bark at people and it's just the way it is. Chile, they use wooden boats a lot. And there, there's quite a few steel boats. I did not see any aluminum boats. And now they're starting to make fiberglass boats. Uh, there are a couple of yacht builders in Chile, but yachting is not big in Chile. There are a lot of regulations about navigation, so it, yachting has never really taken off. Uh, generally boats are fishing boats or, or work boats, and wood and steel is what they're made from. Chile has got a bunch of good boat building woods. I forget the names of them, but you can still get wooden boats built there. What latitude are you at about? What latitude? We're at 45 degrees south, approximately, at this point. Okay. Imalink is a real fishing village, because you got the stat statue of the mermaid in front of the church. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the challenges of anchoring in Patagonia, because it's windy and it's mountainous, okay? so you want to get away from the wind, you want to get close to shore. Now the bottom drops off like this because it's mountainous. So if you're anchoring, you've, you've got a big swinging circle and you can't get that close to shore in case the wind shifts and puts you on the rocks. So what you try and generally do is find a small little nook where you can tie the boat up with shorelines. So you anchor and then you row shorelines out. And in this picture, I or my crew is just rowed out this line from the boat and it's going to be tied up to a rock or a big tree. And you can see that I've got one out this side, one out the other side, and the anchor as well. Uh, so sometimes I've, I've had as many as five shorelines out. It depends on where you can tie them, how much wind you're expecting. And it, it takes at least two hours to anchor. It's, it's quicker to get going in the morning because you just have to cast them off, but it's, it's a long and involved process when you've got to do shorelines. Ten miles up a fjord, we got to the first, our first glacier. And these, these things are always beautiful to look at. And I got my crew in the dinghy to take a picture under sail. These are so hard to get, but I'm looking forward to Richard Sherman's presentation on how to do better marine <laughs> photography. And I guess nowadays you got drones. I don't know. I didn't have a drone. Maybe these pictures are easier to get now, but it took a lot to get this. Puerto Eden is the most isolated settlement in Patagonia. And the population is now down to 70 people. It is the last, the last of a, a tribe called the Alakaluf natives live there and people live on, on shellfish harvesting. There's no road, there's no road, there's no airstrip. The ferry calls twice a week. And there's a big school, but I didn't see any children. The, because it rains a lot, this is kind of the front, the beach road. They've made this boardwalk, and this is the entrance to someone's house with the, the rooster there. And it's just a, a settlement <laughs> in decay. The name says it all. <laughs> Despite attempts at fixing this up, I mean, the Puerto Eden is, is, is just decaying, sadly. But most of Patagonia is beautiful. 
the main navigation channels are marked and they're pretty well charted now. When you get off the main channels, then there are no nav aids and the charting varies. Uh, it might be extremely light on detail, uh, might have been made a few hundred years ago, or it might be accurate and up to date. And you always got to look out for ice, especially the farther south you go. This is a, this is a growler. Growlers are ice less than, fi uh, less than 15 feet long. You call it a growler from the noise it makes when it hits your hull. <laughs> Assuming you survive that. And well, that's another growler. And this is, this is uh, my Chilena crew member. She's from the island of Chiloé. And she looks like people from Chiloé look like her. They're a mixture of Spanish and native. And, and this is just what it's like to get off the main channels and into the beautiful islands of Patagonia. There's thousands of islands, tons and tons of places to anchor. And they're all just beautiful. This particular anchorage, of, of, uh, you may not be able to see it, but I got shorelines out. The entrance is over here, very, very narrow. And in Patagonia, the, the, the growth, the, the vegetation in the trees, it tends to grow right down to the water. So if you want to go ashore, well, you've got, I mean, here is tidal, you can go ashore there, but otherwise, if you want to go ashore, you kind of need a machete. I mean, we had a machete. It's a very useful thing to have. took a side trip to Puerto Natales, mostly for fuel. This, the distance from Puerto Montt to here is close to a thousand miles, and uh, partly to get fresh food and crew change. And once you go inland, you get away from the, the wetness of the coast. You still have all the wind, but the mountains on the coast have dried, taken the moisture out of the air. So it's a lot drier, and Absolutely beautiful. Fantastic hiking in the, this is the Andes Mountains. After Puerto Natales, we retraced our steps and then went back to the coast. So I mentioned Patagonia is windy. One of the reasons it's windy, it's not, part of the reason it's windy is you've got the strong westerlies from the roaring 40s and the furious 50s, driving all those low pressure systems coming around, driving serious amounts of wind. But also you have these catabatic winds called willowas. And a catabatic wind is when you have an obstruction like a mountain and the wind is, is coming up, the mountain stops it. Then the pressure builds and builds and builds until it comes up and it spills over and then it falls down with a furious force and hits the water, spreads out. That's a catabatic wind or a willow in, in Patagonia. At these, when the wind is horizontal after it's hit the water and spreading out, these gusts are up to 100 knots. And they come from the direction, it depends which face of which mountain they came off, that, that determines the direction. So it's hard for you to judge what direction it's going to actually come from, and it, it can vary. And this is the kind of thing that will definitely drag your anchor. It's not going to last long, but it'll, it'll do, <laughs> it can certainly put you on the rocks in the time it does last. In this case, you see all the water in the air here from the gust. The gust actually came from a mountain that's around the corner behind here, and then it came up this channel and spread out here. So it's, it's not nearly as powerful as it was when it actually hit the water. But these willowas are, are uh, one of the challenges of, of Patagonia. And our last anchorage before the Strait of Magellan. Nice, small, tight little sheltered, well sheltered spot. Very nice, we could, we could relax before the Strait of Magellan, which we knew was going to be different than this. Now, the Strait of Magellan is named after Ferdinand Magellan. He was a Portuguese navigator sailing for the King of Spain. And Spain wanted to find a way to the Spice Islands that did not involve going around Portuguese controlled the, the south of Africa because the Pope gave that to, to Portugal. So he, in 1520, Ferdinand Magellan had five ships. They left Spain, one ship deserted, two were lost, one was later abandoned, 
And one ship, Magellan's ship, made it through the strait we call Strait of Magellan to the Pacific Ocean and then went west about around the world and back to Spain. Magellan himself got involved in a religious war in the Philippines and, and he, was, he died in the Philippines. His ship went back without him and they later named the strait after him. When he saw the cooking fires of all the natives in the area, there were so many of them that he named it Land of Fire, Tierra del Fuego, which is what we call this island now. And another name that he came up with, the natives that live there, like the climate is always wet and windy and cold. So snow and rain, snow and rain, snow and rain. No no insulation on clothes works in those temperature in those conditions. I mean, even fur doesn't work that well when it's always wet. So the natives adapted by going around naked because no clothing worked. So they were always naked. And this caused them to develop thick skins. And particularly on the feet, their skin got very thick. Magellan, seeing this, considered them, called them big-footed. Patagones. And that name has now been applied to this whole general area of the south of South America, Patagonia. So that was Ferdinand Magellan. The Strait of Magellan is a windy place with a lot of shipping. It's, it's still used by lots of, lots of uh, freighters. But it's got some really nice anchorages that are very well protected. Complicated to get into a lot of them, but totally protected. This particular anchorage we shared with this crab boat and we traded some alcohol for crabs. It was fantastic. <laughs> These guys, they just leave the lines tied to the rocks. They just drop them when they leave and then they come back and they tie up. So they're just tied up to the rocks there. So we came in the Strait of Magellan about a third of the way and we did not follow it to the Atlantic. We then took another route out and got back to the Pacific coast. Another beautiful anchorage, just so many beautiful anchorages. And you can probably see the shorelines here. And we came along the coast and then into the Beagle Channel to Ushuaia. Now the, the Beagle, everyone's heard, probably everyone has heard of HMS Beagle because Charles Darwin sailed around the world uh, as a guest of the captain of HMS Beagle and that's when, he, during that voyage around the world, he looked at all the, the animals and he came up with his theory of natural selection. So that's what HMS Beagle is most known for and they named the, the channel after it. When Charles Darwin was aboard, the captain of the Beagle was Robert Fitzroy. And he's not as well known, but he, when he retired from the Royal Navy, he invented a few barometers, a few types of barometers, and he started the National Weather Service in Britain. He actually created the world's first weather forecast. What he did was he put, had some people with barometers on the west coast of England and they telegraphed their results and they came up with a forecast for the East Coast. And if any of you sailed in the UK, you know the BBC shipping forecast. In honor of Mr. Fitzroy, who started the National Weather Service, they've now named one of their sea areas Fitzroy. So he's not as well known as Charles Darwin, but he was an important person in meteorology, the former captain of the Beagle. And in the Beagle Channel, as you get farther inland, you get away from the, the rain, it still gets windy, and there's some more beautiful anchorages. This particular one, actually, it's so small we couldn't anchor. We just tied with three lines to the shore. There was no room to swing. And, and we bumped on the way in, but a beautiful place to hang out. There's several glaciers on fjords off the Beagle Channel. Uh, they're always nice to look at. And there, there's always a current coming off the glacier from the meltwater 
or at least in the summer when you visit them, there's always a current coming off and lots of little pieces of ice to watch out for. I wasn't entirely successful this time in watching out for all the pieces of ice and one of my propellers hit a small piece of ice and started making a noise. And that's another look at that glacier through a tree that I don't know how it got grew like that, but it did. So not far away, because I had this noise from the propeller, I found this, this gently sloping gravel beach and scouted it out at low water, took some fenders, tied them to rocks to mark a channel, and then the next day, at high tide, drove the boat up onto the beach and let the tide go out. And another advantage of the centerboard boat is that it sits upright when you put it on the beach. I have these legs I carry, they're, they're made of ironwood and they're tied fore and aft and they're bolted to the bulwarks to prevent the boat from tipping over. And we use this to inspect the propeller and shaft and clean the boat bottom while we were at it. But there is, there is no facilities to haul out. In Ishwaya, there's probably a construction crane that could lift the boat, but that was 100 miles away. And then the next place would be Puerto Montt, uh, 1,000 miles away. So we went along the Beagle Channel to Ishwaya. Ishwaya is the southernmost city in the world. It's in Argentina. The north side of the Beagle Channel is Argentina. The south side is Chile. And Ishwaya is a... Tourism is a major industry here. Uh, 50,000 people live here. You see a casino at the end of the dock. It's at the end of the road system in South America. So it's, it's easy, relatively easy to get to. Lots of buses go there. And there's lots of hiking tours you can go on in the Andes from Ushuaia. And most, most, pretty much all the ships and, and a lot of the yachts that go to Antarctica leave from Ushuaia. And I also went to Antarctica from Ushuaia, but that is a story for another time. <laughs> We have questions. Yes. Can you talk about your rig? Can I talk about my rig? Yes. Uh, so, a staysail schooner, actually, both masts, it, you can barely tell that it's a schooner, not a catch. Uh, it kind of depends on the angle of the camera. Both masts are actually, they're actually the same height, they're 50, uh, 15 meters, 50 feet, but this, the aft mast, they're both stepped on deck, so the aft mast is stepped about a foot higher, it's stepped on the pilot house, making this a schooner. Um, there's a roller furling Yankee jib. There used to be a roller furling four staysail, but the furler broke, and so I converted it to uh, shackle-on, and now it's hank-on when I got some hanks. This, this, I, it broke down in Labrador, and you can't buy hanks, so you bought shackles. There's a roller furling main staysail, and it's hard for me to see if I've got a fisherman up. Do it? Yes. Is there, there is a fisherman up. Uh, the fisherman originally, uh, the fisherman looks a little strange on this boat. Originally, the fisherman what had a, a furler on the back of the foremast, a worm gear furler, and it went into some cowl system. And it never worked well. The previous owner, he told me he had to climb up to the second spreaders to pull it out because it would get jammed in this cowl that it went inside. Um, he took it off and I didn't want anything to do with it. So I put, uh, there was also a sail track on the back of the foremast. So I put slugs on the, the luff of the fisherman which makes it a lot easier to handle the fisherman because it's not just attached by the halyard here and here, it's actually attached to the mast and it is under a lot more control when you're raising and lowering, especially when you're doing it single-handed. And I, I normally sail with crew, but I've sailed about a quarter of the time, so 18,000 miles I've sailed on this boat by myself. And even when I do sail with crew, I, I tend to do one-person watches. so. 
whoever's on watch needs to be able to handle all the sales by themselves. So I'm big on making sales easy to handle, and that's why I like the fisherman being on a the loft of the fisherman being controlled by a track. Does that answer your questions about the rig? How many crew did you carry? How many crew did I carry? Uh, on this trip, uh, at most I had three crew. Usually I had two. And uh, at other times I was by myself. But uh, what we're talking about today, it was two or three people plus me. Richard, obviously there's a lot of navigational challenges um, in that whole trip. How many of those were learn as you go and well, what could you do to uh, find information that helped you understand the currents and things like that? What could I do for voyage planning or for the specifics of navigation in difficult places, or both? Both. Both. For the specifics of navigation in difficult places, you read what other people have done. You read books on navigation. I, when I went, I did not have, okay, normally I, I navigate with a chart plotter uh, that, I, that I put together. Um, I used to navigate with paper charts, but I, I've come to love chart plotters because they're absolutely fantastic. When you're entering a strange port, you don't have to take bearings and plot fixes. You can just run the boat and look. Being able to look at a screen and know where you are is fantastic. However, if, if the charts, the latitude and longitude is wrong on the charts because it's an old chart, then the chart plotter isn't going to help you much. Uh, I prepared for Patagonia, you can buy, because all the charts are expensive, they're like $40, $50 a piece, uh, you can, Chile sells this book this big, well, of one quarter size reproductions of all their charts for about 100 bucks. So I had that, so I could, I wanted to be able to navigate with that. Well, plotting courses and fixes, plotting fixes on a one quarter size chart, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. I got a Walmart sewing lamp that really ran on 12 volt and had a lighted LED lights around a magnifier that I, and I built a little holder for this so I could read the, the quarter size chart and, and plot things with the, the parallel rules. Um, but then I, I lucked out because someone gave me some electronic charts for, for Chile once I I got there, and then I was able to mostly navigate with them. I think that answers the preparation. Also, you need there. There's a couple of cruising guides for Patagonia. One put out by the Royal Cruising Club, and it's worth. It covers all of Chile, and uh, one that's specifically for Patagonia, which everyone calls the Italian book because the authors are Italian. It actually has, is called Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego Cruising Guide, something like that. And it's, it's about this thick. And it, it details like all these, these places where I went to and you tie up with shorelines. You know, it, it details all that, tells you what the depths are in the approach and all sorts of useful things like that. Uh, they make it an awful lot easier to cruise there because if you're going someplace that's uncharted, you've never been before, you've got to go really closely and preferably go ahead with the dinghy and sound and figure out all that. It's nice to have a cruising guide and to go to places that are covered by the guide. Did that answer your question? Thank you. And back. Um, two questions. Um, did you ever have any locals run into your uh, landlines, uh, unsuspecting locals in little boats? And what's your next trip? Did I ever have any unsuspecting locals run into my shorelines? And what's my next trip? I, I never had any unex anyone run into my shorelines. Gen the places where you're using shorelines, there's generally no one else around. So uh, there's no one who would accidentally run into them. There are a few harbors where uh, fishermen have, have left lines running across. And another reason not to navigate at night. <laughs> There, that that makes you know that you can just you got a line running across the the cove you can tie to and uh, but you've got to know that it's there rather than running into it which you would do at night uh, it's handy as long as you know it's there and your second question was where am I going next I would like to go back to North Labrador and West Greenland uh, my boat is now in ashore in Northeast Newfoundland. I'm living on a little 26-foot boat near Toronto for the winter. I'm, I'm working now. I, I, have to, I have to work before I can afford my next adventure. 
Uh, but I would like to go back to North Labrador and West Greenland. They're beautiful, truly beautiful cruising places. And that's part of the reason my boat is in Newfoundland, because it's, it's uh, considerably closer to there than it would be many other places. Yes? With no harbor, no decent harbor on Easter Island, how did they get trucks and cars ashore? With no decent harbor on Easter Island, how did they get trucks and cars ashore? I think they used uh, smaller boats to transport them. Maybe boats like that fish farm boat. I'm, I'm really not sure. Maybe they put a barge. I, I'm not sure how they did that. They do have jets, 737 jets that fly in. And, and the way most people get to Easter Island is from Santiago by air. But I, I'm not entirely sure how they got the, the cars and trucks there. Uh, what was the average wind from Eastern Island, Easter Island over to uh, the shore of the coast? The average wind from Easter Island to Chile. At, at first it was light, like uh, 10 knots at most, because we were near the South Pacific High. And then as we got farther south, away from the center of the high and into the roaring 40s, it was 20 to 30 knots, generally. Yeah. Encounter any problems clearing in, clearing out uh, the various countries? Did I encounter any problems with clearing in or clearing out of various countries? No problems. Uh, Chile, the, the, the bureaucracy is serious. You have to, it's not the clearing in and out. The clearing in, you, in, we cleared in in Easter Island and they, the Navy came out with a boat and the boat had the, the health, the customs, the immigration and the, the Navy aboard. So we did all the paperwork on my boat at anchor. But in Chile, the, uh, the Navy is, has, has a great control um, for his, for, for, from the time when Pinochet was, was the dictator of Chile. Um, they keep a strong control on the people. You need permission to go anywhere with a boat. To go, unless you are going and returning to the same port in 24 hours, you need to actually have paper permission specifying where you are going. And you are supposed to report in twice a day uh, by radio or email. And they're okay if you only do that once a day. But if, if you do that, if you, if you leave it more than two days, you're, you're in trouble. And, and after five days, they will come and look for you. So it's, if you're in some fjord where, where it's hard to get a satellite is fixed. I had a satellite email uh, and I don't have an SSB. Uh, that would do a bit better at getting around the, the mountains, but it, it can be a, a problem to make those daily contacts. Uh, so there's a lot of bureaucracy in Chile, but I had no real problems. Yes? Were there any specific environmental regulations that you found comfortable or, or hard to comply with during your journey? Any specific environmental regulations that were cumbersome or hard to comply with? The only one I would say was uh, Isla Socorro in Mexico. I didn't explain that, but I, I said I took a jog west and then south to Easter Island. I, I actually went to Isla Socorro, which I couldn't find out information about. It's a, it's a group of islands uh, about 300 miles from Mexico. It, it is a... Um, it's a protected area. You go, you anchor, and the Navy keeps a, the Mexican Navy has a base there. You anchor in front of that, and then they'll, they'll explain to you that you can anchor as long as you want, but you can never go ashore, because it's a protected bird sanctuary. It was not a problem for us. I didn't know the, the rules. It, it's, it, it's, it's hard to find out how you're allowed to go there. I, I know some people have managed it, but I didn't follow the right procedures. So we, we just anchored and then left. But no other problems due to environmental regulations. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, another uh, problem question. Uh, in this trip or other ones you've taken, have you ever had problems with pirates? Have I ever had problems with pirates? I have not had problems with pirates on any of my trips. There was a time in Brazil, I was motoring in a flat calm. I can only motor at five five and a half knots. It's, it's, it doesn't have a big, it, you know, I can sail a lot faster than I can motor. There was a flat calm, so I'm motoring along. There's a fishing boat motoring along, so I, I, I move to avoid him. I don't know if he's, I'm not sure if he's fishing or not. I move to avoid him. He moves closer to me. I move to avoid him. He moves closer to me, and I realize, okay, okay, he's coming over to talk. And 
I'm single-handing. And, and he comes up close, and, and, and then he holds up a... One of those guys holds up a lobster and, and a crab, and he, he says, you know, asks if I got any alcohol to trade for it. And so I, I said, yeah, sure. So I, I ran down below to get the alcohol, and I thought, oh, so I have just pointed out that I'm the only one on this boat <laughs> that doesn't motor as fast as his in a flat calm, and, <laughs> and I am not armed, anything like that. I thought, hmm, that wasn't a smart idea, but anyway, we... We threw the, the, uh, the alcohol and the, the crab and lobster. We did the, tran the, the transfer and everyone was happy. We went our separate ways. But that's the only time I really ever thought about pirates. I haven't been to places where there are pirates. How much fuel do you carry? How much fuel do I carry? I carry 1,400 liters. So 300 gallons, something around 300 gallons.